Hi, 97. I'm Nessa, and I'm sitting here with Jamal Joseph, which I'm so thankful for you to, you know, make some time to come and talk to us. And people are wondering, like, what's going on? Who is this person? This person was part of the Black Panther Party, which started, what, about 50 years ago? Yeah, this is, this is the 50th anniversary uh, of the founding of the Black Panther Party. Wow. And October uh, is officially uh, the founding date, and so there's going to be big events in Oakland, California, and then in November, a big event here in New York City. It, it, it's hard to believe that 50 years have passed because uh, the Panthers remain so relevant in so many ways. Yes. And the image and the iconography. We were all very, very young. I actually joined the Black Panther Party when I was 15 You years were the old. youngest one, right? I was the youngest member of the New York chapter of the Black Panther Party. <sighs> this is crazy. So just a little bit, you also worked with Afini Shakur which is amazing and you know we obviously miss her so much already because we just saw what she was able to give to us which was Tupac Shakur so we have so many questions so many so what made you want to join the Black Panther Party and are you still considered part of it yeah I think the last part is that we still consider ourselves to be Panthers there used to be a period of time when uh, we would say or people would introduce us and they would say former members of the Black Panther Party and now people just says member of the Black Panther Party in my case uh, a part of the New York Panther 21 which was the same case that that Afeni Shakur was part of and all of the work that I that I do now I'm a professor at Columbia University in the graduate phenomenal. film school and uh, run a youth program in Harlem called Impact Repertory Theater and I'm a writer and director um, uh, the fact that I'm a Panther and was part of the Black Panther Party is kind of precedes everything else and that and that's fine when I'm introduced and when people talk about that and I think that's important I think that the legacy is important for us to know that young men and women uh, stood up and, and when we get to a Afeni we'll talk about how many men, women were involved at such a young age in such a powerful way that we need that same thing to gay, same thing today yeah. and, and the sad part about it is not that much has changed the, the Panthers have a 10 point program um, and if you go online and look yeah. for the Panther 10 point program October 1966 the points are all there we want land, bread, housing, education, justice and peace and sadly we can't point to a single point uh, in the 10-point program, especially point number seven that was about police brutality that has Crazy. been fully realized. So the struggle does continue. What made you want to join the party? I was 15 years old. Yeah. I was a member of the NAACP Youth Council at my church. I was an honor student. Um, I was a semi-orphan kid. I was being raised by, by adopted grandparents. They weren't my real parents, but uh, they raised me in that kind of southern tradition and believed in civil rights and their parents had been slaves and Dr. King got killed and it radicalized me and I think a whole generation of young people. I was living in the Bronx. There wasn't a Panther office in the Bronx yet or in Harlem so we took this long trek out to Brooklyn or to Nostrand Avenue and I remember riding out there with two guys that were older than me and and you know to be clear I was like a lot of young black men then and now um, in that I was doing good in school and I went to church, but I was looking for that that image of manhood. Yeah. So I was on the street corner and on the basketball courts, living that kind of that that kind of I won't even call it a double life. I would say the life of a young man searching for manhood. Yeah. When there's not positive role models right there in the home. Right. Um, so when I saw the Panthers, uh, uh, this news story about the Black Panther Party, they it's when the Panthers stormed the state. Capitol in Sacramento to protest yeah. the changes in the gun laws because the Panthers, uh, when, when they started in Oakland, patrolled the police with shotguns and law books. And the guns were legal. At that time in California, if you didn't have a record, you could carry a rifle or a shotgun, any citizen. And the Panthers started policing the police. And the white legislature said, no, we, when we said anybody could carry a gun, we didn't mean that. Yeah. We didn't mean y'all. We didn't mean some black dudes mm -hmm. and women with berets and guns policing the police. So they... Uh, we're about to change the gun control laws. The Panthers responded in Panther style. Yes. By storming the state <laughs> capital of Sacramento with guns and making this amazing statement of self-defense. And I remember as this kid watching my grandmother's black and white TV going like, they crazy. <laughs> they got guns. They got berets. They didn't storm the white people legislature. And then one reporter said, and they stopped the Panthers vehicles and they found more guns and communist literature inside. I was like, they crazy. They got leather coats, they got guns. The man said they're communists. 
I want to be down with them, yeah. you know, because because that's how you are, like the yeah. roughest and the toughest. When we were headed to the Panther office, there was this long train ride. The guys who were with me uh, were saying, yo, um, yo, Eddie, and I wasn't even Jamal yet. They was like, yo, Eddie, you know, you sure you can do this? This is no joke, man. It's like the mafia. Once you get in, you can't get out. And I was yeah. like, you can't get out. And the other guys, the other, my other friend says, you, you know, you're going to have to prove yourself, right? You know, you, you, you they're going to send you out to to kill a white dude to prove you down and i'm like kill somebody wait a minute but you know you can't be a punk in front of your boys yeah. i was like no i don't care yeah my other friend said no 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 you ain't got to kill a white dude i was like thank you jesus yeah <laughs> he was like you got to kill a white cop and you got to bring in his badge and his gun my heart is pounding but i'm not going to be the first one to run right yeah we get into the panther office and as you can imagine brothers and sisters with their berets, their army fatigue, rocking their dashikis, you know, just bad, beautiful, handsome. I'm sitting in the back row looking at all these older, cool brothers and sisters. I want to put it in perspective. I'm 15, so they were the older brothers and yep. the sisters. They were 19, 20, 21 years old. Gosh. The average age of someone in the Black Panther Party was 20 years old. The person up front is explaining the Black Panther 10-point program. We want freedom, power to determine the destiny of our community, full employment for our people. Number three, decent housing, fit for shelter for human beings, full employment for our people. Nothing about killing a white dude, bringing a cop's badge and go, I'm not hearing this, right? I'm like, got to prove to my boys. I'm going to be a Panther. I'm going to be. He gets to point number five, which is about education. We want an education that teaches us our true history. Yeah. And the true nature of this decade in American society. I jump up. I'm like, choose me, brother. Arm oh, me. I kill a white dude right now. <gasps> Whole meeting gets quiet. Brother calls me up front. Everybody's looking at me. He's sitting behind the desk. He reaches into the bottom drawer of the desk. My heart's pounding in my chest. I was like, oh, man, look how far out he's reaching. He's going to give me a big ass gun. <laughs> and he hands me the secret weapon of revolution and liberation. Gives me a stack of books. <laughs> Autobiography of Malcolm X, Solo on Ice by Elders Cleaver, Wretched of the Earth by Fanon. Uh, we all carried quotations from Mao, a little red book. And so now I think this is a test because I'm still listening to what my boy said. And yeah. I said, um, excuse me, brother. I thought you were going to arm me. And he said, excuse me, young brother. I just did. Oh. Mm. And then as I'm walking back to my seat, and this is important, and it's important <clears throat> when I talk to brothers and sisters in Black Lives Matter movement, black liberation movements, to other people that have taken on Panther imagery. This was a key, the next thing he said. He said, young brother, you came in here really mad at white folk. He said, but let me ask you a question. If all of the cops that are brutalizing people, shooting people down, locking people up, if they were black and the people being brutalized were white, if all of the shopkeepers and businessmen in the community were black and the people being ripped off would spoil vegetables, rotten meat, high prices, if they were white. He says, if everybody that was in power, all these demagogic, lying, fascist, pig politicians, because the Panthers would bring it. He said, but if they were black and all the people being exploited and oppressed were white, would that make things correct? And, and then I answered with my brain instead of my little adolescent, wounded adolescent mm -hmm. ego, and I said, um, no, brother, it seems like it would still be wrong. He said, that's right, young brother. This is a class struggle for human rights, not just a race struggle for civil rights. Yeah. And the sophistication of the Black Panther Party and the very thing that made the Black Panther Party powerful in the movement in terms of bringing all kinds of radical groups together was that they understood that we were oppressed not just because of the color of our skin, but because of this economic system that we live in, that we were, in fact, a money-making tool. Slavery was a business. Yeah. The kind of oppression where we were the factory workers or the reserve industrial armies is a business, and today mass incarceration is a business. Not it just is. because they hate black and brown folks. It's money. It's money. It's money. It is billions of dollars. It's a billion-dollar industry. So when you make that connection is when the government really comes after you, is at the point that Dr. King began talking about class struggle, not just race struggle. Yeah. Remember, when he was in Memphis, he was organizing black and white sanitation workers in Memphis and Chicago and began connecting the dots between the labor movement and the civil rights yep. movement. Had to go. Brother Malcolm left the Nation of Islam, 
became El Haj Malik yeah. and came back and started talking about black and white people working together. But here's what's key. You know, we history usually stops at the point where they talk about, well, Malcolm didn't hate white people anymore. But Malcolm began to critique this capitalist system. He gave an amazing speech at Oxford yes. University yes. six months before he was killed, yep. where he talked about class struggle and revolution. Yep. And when you begin to talk about that, and when the Black Panther Party said, all power to the people, but that means black power to black people. People said, yeah. And then we would say, but that means white power to white people. It means brown power to brown people, yeah. red power to red people, yellow power to yellow people. And they go, what do you mean? Then you start talking about your class brothers and sisters, yeah. the majority of folks in this country who are suffering and organizing. And that kind of people's revolution is what really scares folk. Now, the other part of the story that's important is that as I was walking to my seat, I run into the beautiful, dynamic, one of the leaders of the Black Panther Party in New York, Afeni Shakur, who says to me, how old are you? <laughs> and of course, when you're 15 years old, a year means a lot, right? Yeah, of yeah, course. That's what you so I said, I'm 16. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and one quarter, you yeah, know, you start adding the months. Just, and a half, yeah. And a half. And she looks at me, she said, you, she says, you're about 13 or 14 years old, go home. <laughs> And I was like, I want to be a Panther. And yeah. she was like, I, you know, go home. And I was kind of slipping, almost playing like, like, like tag with her. And like, I'd go to one part of the office and she says, okay. She says, I'm keeping an eye on you. Hmm. And from that moment on, she took me under the wing. And Afeni became my big sister in the Black Panther Party. And I would say my big sister to life. Whatever I accomplished. Uh, in life. As I got older, it didn't matter that, you know, that I became a father, that I started, uh, you know, running youth programs, that I became a professor, all of that stuff. Big Sister Faney always had the strength and the wisdom um, that I needed yeah. uh, as a black man. And I'm proud to say that I'm a black man. Yes, I grew up in the Black Panther Party. The, 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 um, the, the search for manhood uh, walked me through the door. But a key person in my life, black, black women raised me. Yeah. And one of those key people that taught me more about manhood than any of the men in the Black Panther Party was a feigning. Yeah, so amazing. I, I mean, just hearing that, again, it's like for the younger generation, we always hear about the stories and what, you know, being part of the Black Panther Party, but like actually hearing this from you is amazing right now, just to uh, trying to get a visual of everything at yeah. that time. So. Uh, Obviously, the loss of her. I mean, where were you when you heard the news about Afeni's passing? I slept late because I had been editing. I was uh, I was editing a film uh, that I've been working on a documentary about prisons and and the, and uh, Daniel Beatty's work. Amazing actor. He's he's the lead of my film Chapter and Verse, a, a, a film that I directed that uh, that's playing in in the festivals and be on BET in the fall. And um, we had edited late, and I got a call. The first text that I woke up, woke up to was from my pastor, Pastor Mike Waldron at First Corinthian Baptist Church, who was a dynamic, progressive young minister who met Afeni because I brought Afeni to meet him and said, I'm so sorry about Sister Mother Afeni. And I was like, what? So sorry, what does this mean? Yeah. And then I just looked at my phone, and here were messages coming in from everywhere, and then I began to call family, you yeah. know, from the Shakur family, my nieces and nephews. And I say that because, um, you know, to, from Tupac to, uh, to Setchwa, you know, Afeni, Afeni's daughter, all of them, they all call me Uncle Jamal because I had that relationship, was there when Pac was born, knew him so his whole crazy. life. And it was unbelievable because Afeni wasn't sick, you know. Yeah. Um, sometimes you hear that someone has an illness, you know, when, when, you know, when Muhammad Ali went in, we all prayed, but we all knew that, you know, yeah. the champ had been struggling a little bit. So it was heartbreaking. It was a shock, but we knew. Um, but Afeni was fine and wonderful, vibrant. We had spoken to each other a couple of weeks earlier. And it just literally, um, not afraid to say it, knocked me to my knees. I went to my knees with grief and prayer at the loss of someone who meant so much to so many people. She was godmother to all my children. Wow. Um, and was there for my children who are now all adults and college grads, but was there for them in vital ways at different points in my life. My oldest son, who has a master's in film from Columbia, wow. has sickle cell anemia, wrote a beautiful Facebook post about how Auntie Afeni would be there with him in the hospital. Um, pieces of art and encouragement she would give him over the years. Uh, Setchwa helped raise our kids. She babysit 
Oh you know, Fanny's daughter, all of, you know, all through through their young years. So our bond was really just a bond. It's not just the memory of time that we spent in the Panther Party. And to see a Fanny, um, uh, to see a Fanny's strength, you know, there's there, there, there's this idea of courage that we know, and we all know how it is. Like when you, you know, when you're growing up and you're with your family, especially if you got a big family, and someone says something to you, and all your family comes, and you're like, yeah, what? Say something now. Yes. <laughs> right? Say something now, right? If you're a boy, you're rolling up your sleeves. If you're a girl, you're putting on the yes. Vaseline. But when you're alone, right, with your beliefs, and when you're alone with this, um, and when there's not that reinforcement. So <clears throat> there's a story that, 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 that I'll share. We'll talk about Afeni's memorial coming up. And um, but, uh, but, but Pac had been killed. Yeah. And we were in Atlanta, and we were working on a big memorial at the Atlanta Convention Center, and and I was and I was there, you know, helping kind of with the run of show and with some other stuff, and I was due to do some some poetry with George Faison, and as you can imagine, folks came in from all over, jazz artists and hip hop artists, and I get a call from the stage manager that I should get on the phone, and Afeni's on the phone, and she said. Jamal Yafeo has been shot. Um, Yaki Yafeo was one of the outlaws, mm -hmm. but he was also a Panther Cub. We call all of our children's Panther Cubs, the son of Yasmin Fula and Sekou Odinga, who was a political prisoner who yeah. recently got out of prison. And he said, and he's on life support. And Yasmin is on her way up to say goodbye, and then they're going to pull the plug. And she said, this is just too much now. Can you come home? And so I left. And I went to uh, to her home, and and there were a group of people there, and we prayed, and we found ourselves four days later, after Tupac's Atlanta Memorial in New Jersey in a small chapel, and when I drove up with my wife, the chapel was so small. It was a beautiful chapel sitting on a hill. But it was so small that you saw just young people, you know, street yeah. soldiers, hip hop kids from the door of the chapel down to the sidewalk. We made our way upstairs and there were some seats up front that they had for a family, an extended family, and I sat. But again, the back of the chapel, if you can imagine, nothing yep. but yeah. young people. And so uh, people said a few words. Um, I got up and said a few words. I can't remember what I said or if it, if it meant anything, because this is all I remember about that day. Afeni got up to speak. Keep in mind that this is someone whose son had just been killed. Oh, my gosh. And whose godson had just been killed. So two boys that she helped to raise. And, of course, everyone got really quiet to see what Afeni Shakur had to say. And she looked around and she says, I don't know many things. But I know two things. The first thing that I know is that Tupac and Yafeo, as young black men, are finally free. Mm. That there is no more pain or oppression in their life. And the second thing I know that as we grieve for them, look around you. Look in the back of this church. Look at that window. She said, you see all of those young people? She said, they're alive. And they need us. And she sat down. One of the greatest speeches I've ever heard, probably about three minutes long, that was Afeni Shakur, that in her moment wow. of most profound grief, she remembered that we had to live not for ourselves, but for the young people who were behind us. Gosh, so powerful. Powerful sister, amazing so sister. So powerful. You know, the other thing I want to say about her, and I know there's questions, but you, you of know. Of course, no, I, you're answering base everything. Is, yeah. is that, you know, um, when people talk about Afeni, um, and, you know, I, look, I don't know how she's going to be portrayed in, in the film that's coming out. And I got a chance to read a few early drafts to this, to, of the script. I wasn't real excited about the way she was portrayed. I had an opportunity to write a lot about Afeni in my book, Panther Baby, yeah. uh, where, I, where I could tell some of these stories. Um, but a lot of times when you, when you hear about Afeni, it is former Black Panther, crackhead, Tupac's mother. Yes. Right? And in between those hyphens was a woman who was who did tremendous good in the movement and in the community. And I want to be more specific about that. When she was in the Black Panther Party, yeah. she 
organized tenants, building upon building in Harlem. She helped organize a health care movement. Wow. And by that I mean when we, it, it was Panthers and Young Lords and progressive uh, health care workers uh, uh, organization, healthcare workers, doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, and the Young Lords, for you know, for our viewers and listeners that don't know, um, were a group of, of young Puerto Rican, primarily Puerto Rican, but Latino revolutionaries. Um, uh, they were a street gang in Chicago. Yep. Uh, Chair, Chairman Fred Hampton helped politicize Cha Cha Jimenez, who was the leader of the Young Lords, mm -hmm. and they said, we're, we're not a street gang anymore, we're a revolutionary party. They began to take over hospitals and, and make two things happen. So Lincoln Hospital, Harlem Hospital, they started opening those clinics up so folks could come in and get treated whether wow. they had money or not. Panther offices and Young Lords offices became health clinics on the weekend where doctors and nurses and, and health care workers volunteered and they demanded change. And so the patient's bill of rights, if anybody has been to the hospital or visited someone that's in the hospital, when you look on the wall and you see that patient bill of yep. rights, that was authored by healthcare workers, Panthers, and Young Lords. Wow. You know, sisters like Afeni Shakur and Cleo Silvers and other people who were on the front line authored that. Now, the first draft was much more radical than what we see now, but the idea that patients had rights and the idea that every human being in our society has a right to medical care, whether they have money or not, was was was, was something that was galvanized and pushed forward by Fanny Shakur and healthcare workers. Uh, after the Black Panther Party, she was a paralegal and she worked uh, for an organization called South Bronx Legal Services. And as a paralegal, Afeni literally saved thousands of homes, thousands of people from eviction. Now, wow. we take for granted um, that when someone is being evicted, that there is a process that they have to go through now. Landlord just can't go like, get out, right? Yeah. They have to serve you with eviction papers. You get a chance to, uh, to respond to it. You get a chance to get representation if you don't have it. You get a chance to come up with some kind of agreement or a payment plan. None of that existed in, in before wow. the late 1960s. Landlord would come, Mr. So-and-so from downtown or from Long Island or wherever he lived, decided he wanted you out. You got out, he paid the marshals, they were kicking you out. <gasps> A Faney and Panthers, and I would be there with the would physically be there to prevent the marshals from putting people out, would show people how to put their money into escrow accounts to make repairs on the building and could hire and could, could hire legal counsel and oftentimes we'd find free legal counsel and kind of fight um, a corrupt landlord driven housing system in New York City. And so in the Black Panther Party and then in South Bronx Legal Services, Afeni did that work. So there's wow. people in the medical community and the legal community that truly remember Afeni's work. And so this period that we're talking about, uh, you know, and from there Afeni moved to Baltimore. And as we know, Tupac went to, you know, Baltimore um, uh, School of the Performing Arts. You know, we're talking about a period of, um, of a couple of years you know, where Faney was on drugs and where Faney was dealing with what all of us now call post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah. Um, Panthers weren't Vietnam veterans. They didn't have a name for it there, but we experienced death. We experienced imprisonment. We experienced our families ripped apart. So you can imagine that pain. We were part of the walking wounded. I dare say this, and sometimes people find, find this controversial, um, but, but, but Faney never backed away from controversy, and Tupac didn't, so I'm not. I knew Faney during those years, yeah. you know, when she was on drugs. I dare say that Afeni was more functional, sharper, and stronger about her beliefs on drugs than many people who are sober with college degrees are right now. I, so I don't this, see the problem this, with that. This <laughs> image of, 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 you know, how I've seen Afeni talked about or portrayed in the scripts, and I dare say, you know, portrayed in films that might come out, of being in some crack house, uh, in a stupor, in some corner was not who Afeni was, ever was in her life, even on a bad day. Her worst day, she was better than most folks. Yeah. And then after she decided that for her son and for her children, that she, that, 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 that she needed to get stronger, she did and never looked back. And no matter all of the blows that were dealt with her and all of the fights that she had to have around his integrity and his estate, she never wavered. Amazing, amazing woman. She's amazing. I think it's also amazing that you're able to give us this point of view. I've never heard of that. 
uh, like you said, it's always just those hyphens that we hear about. Now, the book Panther Baby, we get to know more of that side of Afeni. And this is me at 16 years old in front, wow. of, the, in front of the Panther office. Uh, and I had just come out on bail on the Panther 21 case. The Panther 21 case, that number 21 was the number of people indicted in New York City right. who were in any kind of leadership in the Black Panther Party. And so that's from the five boroughs. Right. And although I was the youngest and only 15 years old and then had just turned 16 and was arrested, I had become head of the high school cadres and um, got some of the more quote unquote advanced training. And so they deemed me as one of the leaders. So I got arrested as well. And there were two women, Afeni and Joan Bird. Um, our bails were set at $100,000. Uh, which is a lot of money today. In 1969, Gosh, can't that even was the imagine. equivalent of like five or ten million dollars. Absolutely. And who were we? I mean, who were the Black Panthers before we became Panthers? We were students, Vietnam veterans, um, formerly incarcerated people, welfare mothers, former street folks. You know, street niggas. You yeah, know what I mean? Absolutely. Who got radicalized in the way that Malcolm and George Jackson and other people did, and said, "We can make a change." We can take what we know about the streets. We can take what we know about our people. We can take the love that we have for our folks that other people don't don't have, and we can fight. Um, so certainly no one had that kind of money. People came together of conscious, good people, black and white, and started to raise money in increments. The first person that we voted to come out on bail was Afeni Shakur. Wow. Because we knew Afeni's leadership ability. We knew who she was as a speaker. We knew that as a black woman, she would give you a different image of what a panther was because what was splattered across the press was the right. scary image of the big, bad black dude with a gun and a beret. And then I was the second one to come out wow. uh, as a youthful offender. And for a few months, it was just Afeni and I as members of the Panther 21 that were going around, going around the country speaking, raising money for the legal fund. But we still had jobs to do as Panthers. We didn't get a pass on getting up and working at the breakfast program or organizing those buildings or being on community patrol. But there was always supposed to be someone with us. We were yeah. always supposed to ha kind of have an escort um, because people had raised money to get us out and we were these spokespersons. One morning we wound up uh, at a breakfast program, just a Fanny and I. Um, the other people who were supposed to come don't know what happened, miscommunication. Right. People might have been tired. You know, you only got three or four hours sleep in those days. We're cleaning up. We fed about 75 kids, and um, they, were off to, they, were off to, they were off to school. You know, the Panthers believed that, you know, uh, uh, kids say, uh, people say our kids don't learn in school, they're disruptive. And we said, well, maybe the problem is when you're dealing with a, a kid teaching them basic arith arithmetic, uh, and you're trying to explain to them that three apples plus two apples equal five apples, and their stomach is growling. Maybe they can't understand. Maybe they can't understand yeah, that. Exactly. And so without asking permission, with no government grants, we started a breakfast program. We would go to churches and community centers and, and get a basement. Mm -hmm. We would get uh, 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 you know um, uh, donations from uh, food from storekeepers in the area, and we started the program. We're there, and it's just her and I. I'm mopping a fanny's in the back. And about 20 cops roll in with their guns drawn. Oh, my God. And he said, what is this? And I'm saying, so this is my day. Because in the Panthers, you knew any day was a day you could get killed or go to prison. And I said, it's a community program. He's, and he said, what do you mean a community program? I said, we're feeding kids. I knew better than to say a Black Panther yeah, breakfast program. A Faney comes out the back. And a Faney was about 5'4", five, 5'5". Five, five. And there was a police lieutenant there asking all of the questions with his, with his gold shield and, you know, he's in his trench coat and all the cops around him. And Afeni comes out the back, completely ignores him, stands between me and him with her back to him and looks at me and says, Jamal, don't say another word to him. And the guy now sees this, this black woman ignoring him. He said, excuse me, miss, is there a problem? And she turns and she says, yes, there's a problem. She says, the problem is I don't talk or deal with police officers and completely ignored him. I immediately got two feet taller. My spine got stronger and I ignored him and his power was gone. He looked around and then he just did like this and all of the cops left. That was the power of Fanny Shakur. Yes. That was Tupac's mama. Jeez. Dear mama. I just got chills. I'm speechless. 
I, I just, I, this ne- I'm so glad, I'm so happy you're here to share this with us. Because, you know, when we hear Tupac talking about his mom and, this, and the songs, but to hear this power, this is where he comes from. This is who taught him. Did you have a chance to talk to him in his, I guess, you know, older days? And how was Pac? Pac was, was, uh, was sensitive, respectful. Uh, the time I spent with him, and the answer is yes. Pac came to, uh, I, I used to run a karate school in Brooklyn when I, when I got out of prison on the Panther 21 case. I, I, I spent a total of, ten and a half, of nine and a half years in prison. Uh, but in between the time, right. I had a karate school and Pac would come, so I taught him karate. And then, you know, Amazing. when he was around, we sit. And so we could have conversations that other folks didn't have because he knew I was there as Uncle Jamal. Yep. You know, I wasn't looking for a record deal, no, no. money. I was trying to make sure he was okay. And... He cared so much. I I, I want to go to um, to a visit that I had with Pac after he was shot, and um, you know the night that Pac was shot outside Quad Studio, and then he went to Bellevue Hospital. When he left the hospital, I'm one of the people that took him out that night because he came down and said, "Look, I don't want to stay here. I don't feel safe." Yeah. And we said, "Pac, you just we got a wheelchair, and he was there." And if Annie turned to me, she said, "Jamal, you talk to him." And I, I knelt in front of Pac, and I put my forehead. On his forehead, something we used to do since he was a little boy. And I said, Pop, nephew, you shot like four or five times. You do, you know, you, you you need medical attention. He was like, Uncle Jamal, if you want to take me someplace, that's fine. I just can't be here, right? Uh, and so we did. And then he wound up, you know, going to a, to another hospital the next day. But I want to talk about a visit that I had with him uh, when in prison, just before he went upstate. Yes. And he was still in the prison ward here in Bellevue, and I came out, and I was a paralegal, so I was able to talk to him one-on-one. And he said, Uncle Jamal, he says, uh, I need to tell you a story. And he said there was a guy in back in the prison ward, a young brother uh, who was having a, you know, a hernia operation. He sees me, and he goes, oh, Pac, you're my hero. You're my hero. And, uh, and he said, young brother, why am I your hero? He says, oh, come on, Pac. You playing, man. Don't be playing. You be getting paid. You got all the women. You be shooting at the police. Come on, man. And he says, stop. Time out. That's why I'm your hero. I don't need to be anybody's hero. Hmm. He says, so Uncle Jamal realized a couple of things. He says, number one, he says, I'm going to stop getting high. He said, because I realized that I've been smoking weed, drinking, smoking weed, drinking, like almost for the last two years. And I need my clarity, and I'm clear now. And I need to do what mommy does in that regard. I said, Pac, I hear that. Yep. How are you going to do that? He said, day by day. He said, the second thing is that I know I'm going to die. They're going to kill me. He says, my choice is it going to be like Tony Montana or Malcolm X. And I want to go like Malcolm X. Mm. And, of course, I said what an uncle would say, what a godfather would say. Come on, Pac, that, you know, glad to hear you doing that, but you're not going to die. And he was like, here's what I need to do. And Tupac began to lay out a plan for community centers, arts programs, for doing film for understanding how celebrity could be used for transformation in the community and working close with his mom on his things. And so from his upbringing, from him being yeah. spokesman for the new African Panthers, when yeah. Tupac used to rap in, in, in Baltimore at yeah. parties as MC New York with condoms. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? Talking about safe sex. He was returning to that. He was in a place where he could slow down. And had he lived, and you know, we, we, we know that he was beginning to break away from certain associations and had done the One Nation Project. And had he lived, and the things that they were talking about building together, um, that not only would hip hop be an amazing place, the movement would be an amazing yeah. place, and young people would be an amazing place with, with Tupac and Afeni together. Our, our, our only um, kind of solace in this moment is that like in the song that Tupac did, I know that they're dancing together in the light. They are, they are. And um, Jamal, we were talking before we started the interview. Now, there is an event to celebrate the life of Afeni. Can you talk to us about that a little bit? Where is it going to be at? Is this an invite only? How does this work? So there is a celebration of Afeni's life. We're calling it a reflection and celebration. And it's going to be Saturday, June 18th, the day before Father's Day. Yeah, A few days after Pac's birthday. A few days after Pac's birthday. And it's going to be at the House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. And uh, the significance of the House of the Lord is that the amazing Reverend Herbert Daughtry, uh, who's minister for the movement, 
uh, was a Fannie and Tupac's pastor. That's when Fannie lived in New York and Pac was a little boy. That's where they were members and they went to church. Uh, and so we have speakers uh, from the movement, from the Black Panther Party, musicians, hip hop artists, poets coming to celebrate the life of a Fannie Shakur. Uh, there'll be RSVP information um, so that you can do the event right online, or if you want to call to make a reservation, uh, the number is 212-926-0104. That's 212-926-0104. Thank you so much for coming by. Now, what if people want to find out what you're doing, how to get a hold of you? Because we had to track you down through family members. I know. What's the easiest way? Do you have a website? Is it Twitter, Instagram? How can people get a hold of you? They can, they can get a hold of me through um, um, at JJ Panther Baby. Yep. Um, and um, they can also drop me an email. My email is JJ Vibe, V I B V I B E, at AOL.com. I really appreciate you coming in here to talk to us and shed so much light on us and to um, remind us of what the the cause of everything that we're doing. There's more to life than just the glam, the TV, the magazines. There's more to life and there's, there's a calling for us and hopefully we could all find our calling and to make it happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.